Good evening, and welcome again to the second of the Pascal Lectures for 2008-2009. I'm a little bit height-challenged with this microphone. Um, the Pascal Lectures began roughly 31 or 32 years ago, uh, inaugurated by a foundational pair of lectures delivered by Malcolm Mugridge in 1978. Since then, we've had quite a distinguished collection of lecturers, and if you have a copy of the program, um, you can find their names on the back cover. Someone asked me recently, why did we call it the Pascal Lectures? I think those of us who were involved in the uh, establishment of the lecture series felt that Blaise Pascal was uh, a prototype of today's modern academic. An academic who not only was... Uh, a, an accomplished uh, scholar, but also who was very much interested in how his Christian faith interacted with the scholarship that he pursued. And our goal in establishing the lectures was to bring to the University of Waterloo each year outstanding individuals who followed in the tradition of Blaise Pascal and who not only had credibility as a scholar, but who also had credibility in terms of the practice of their Christian faith. And so tonight I'm going to invite Professor Wayne Broadland, who's a member of the Pascal Lectures Committee and a professor in civil and environmental engineering, to come and introduce to you the 2008-2009 Pascal Lecturer. Wayne. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Dennis Alexander. He's the director of the Faraday uh, Institute for Science and Religion at St. Edmunds College, Cambridge. He's a former chairman of the Molecular Immunology Program and head of the Laboratory of Lymphocyte Signaling and Development at the Bradman Institute in Cambridge. He's the editor of the Journal of Science and Christian Belief. And he's recently published in both Nature and the New England Journal of Medicine. His latest book, uh, Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose, was published in 2008. And so it's, he is without question a, a, an accomplished scholar. And so he's also a, a person of faith. And, and so I believe that we have uh, found the right person as our speaker tonight, that he meets both of the criteria that uh, David Matthews outlined a few moments ago. You do not have to get very far into one of Dr. Alexander's books to realize that he's not afraid to face challenging issues. He thinks things out with care, and problems do not seem to frustrate him, but rather they present an opportunity to look at the evidence more carefully. He seems to enjoy fitting the pieces together, offering a solution, and challenging others. He writes with integrity, grace, and clarity. We learned last evening that when he speaks, he demonstrates these same qualities. Tonight, he's chosen to address the question, is Darwinism incompatible with purpose? And so it is with pleasure that I give you Dr. Dennis Alexander. Well, again, let me thank you, as last night, very much for your welcome, and also thank the uh, committee of the Pascal Lectures for the invitation to come here, and I'm greatly enjoying my uh, visit here in the University of Waterloo, and indeed meeting quite a wide range of both uh, students and faculty during the time here, which is uh, in itself a very enjoyable part of any visit. Um, I hope that we can welcome some of you here to Cambridge, uh, that's our Cambridge on the other side of the pond, and uh, that you'll come over maybe uh, some people for the summer course that we in the Faraday Institute have in Cambridge every summer. We've shrunk it down to just a week now, um, but uh, we have weekend courses as well, a bit far to go for a weekend, but we have been able to welcome a number of people from Canada to our summer courses over the past few, few years. And uh, so please do take that opportunity um, and come over and then you can take off and spend some time traveling and, and doing the tourism bit as well. 
Now, for those unable to be here last night, we were um, starting by considering the various ways in which Darwinism has been used for ideological purposes in the 150 years since 1859. And as I'm sure you're aware, this is the double anniversary of Darwin this year, not only 1859, the origin of the species, but also um, the, or the 200th anniversary of his birth, uh, February the 12th, 1809. And last night we were thinking about how um, the transformation, the social transformation of Darwinism into many different forms perhaps helps to explain some of the antipathy that is still felt towards uh, evolution by some people even right up to the present day. And so it's quite common for people to respond to evolution as if it was some philosophy, uh, maybe some political ideology, maybe even uh, for intrinsic um, racism or something like that, rather than actually responding to the biological theory of evolution. And that was the topic that we got into last night. And I was suggesting that um, this, is, this is bad for science education. It's uh, bad also for driving an unnecessary wedge between science and religion when Darwinism is interpreted in these various ideological kind of ways. Now, tonight I wish to switch to the, uh, to the science of Darwinian, Darwinian evolution itself. I, I want to see whether it might have, in reality, anything to tell us about philosophy or religion and the test case as it were that I want to use for this kind of investigation is this whole idea of progress before we get to the science um, I'd like to also do just a very quick review about the background of evolution and Darwin in the context of this whole idea of progress Darwinian evolution was born into a culture in which the idea of progress and indeed the role of science in progress was inescapable here is his, um, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, um, who is a, a poet, a rationalist, who was himself an evolutionist in an earlier um, sense of that term. He was also a poet. He saw the whole of life, really, as moving up this great uh, evolutionary chain of being. Here is a typical piece of, uh, of his poetry. I'm, I'm not making any comments on um, his quality as a poet, but simply wanted to read it out as an indication of, of the kind of idea of progress that you had in that very early part of the 19th century. Organic life beneath the shoreless waves was born and nursed in oceans, pearly caves. First forms by Newton, unseen by spheric glass, move on the mud or pierce the watery mass. These, as successive generations bloom, new powers acquire and larger limbs assume. Whence countless groups of vegetation spring and breathing realms of fin and feet and wing and so on. It goes on quite a long time actually, but we eventually of course go onwards and upwards to this imperious man who rules the bestial crowd. So that kind of um, commitment to, to progress, the whole idea of the chain of being, was a very powerful thought culturally um, in the early part of the 19th century. Now, Darwin himself really downplayed notions of progress, certainly in comparison with his grandfather, and also with Lamarck, another uh, very strident progressionist. Yet still, you know, in The Origin of Species, we find Darwin writing, and I quote, that as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. I mean, that's still a very powerful uh, pro progressionist sort of statement of faith, as it were. So actually, far from destroying the idea of progress, Darwin's defenders took it up in a very big way indeed, not least um, Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Henry Huxley, who we were thinking a bit about last night, Herbert Spencer, who popularized, uh, of course, evolution, especially here in North America. Spencer was convinced that progress, and I quote, was not an accident, not a thing within human control, but a beneficent necessity, maintaining that the entire universe was ascending towards ultimate perfection through the operation of inexorable physical laws. And then later, 20th century thinkers such as Théa de Chardin and T.H.'s, T.H. Huxley's grandson, Julian Huxley, both in their rather different ways, um, kept alive this progressionist interpretation of evolution. R.A. Fisher, an Anglican uh, statistician, actually, from Cambridge, who helped to construct the neo-Darwinian synthesis in the 1920s, 1930s, he thought that God had created organisms progressively through natural selection, and that our task here on earth is to promote eugenics, to prevent the decline of the race. That's to quote Michael Ruse, who has written a lot of helpful uh, material on this whole topic of progression. 
One of the greatest of the 20th century evolutionary uh, biologists was Ernst Meyer, who said this to Michael Ruse in a taped interview which he had with him back in 1993 at the end of his very long life, for Meyer indeed lived to the age of 100. By the way, he published his final paper at the age of, of 100. So, an example to us all, I always think. Um, but here he is talking to Michael Ruse in this interview. This is Meyer speaking. In your treatment, referring to Michael Ruse, about half the time you talk about progressionism with a sneer, always illustrated with some detestable examples of racism or male chauvinism. I think much of your writing would be improved if you admit that much of progressionism was a rather noble philosophy. In fact, a very good case could be made for the claim that the current mess is a result of the loss of this philosophy. So that is one of the 20th century's great evolutionary biologists, still very wedded to this whole idea of progression. Now, of course, I think Mayer in this case was referring uh, to discourse about philosophy and ethics rather than to specifically um, to biological evolution. I mean, my personal view with regard to professional uh, biological discourse itself is that I think biologists are and, and were right to exclude um, teleological notions, notions of ultimate goals and purpose and so forth from their own biological discourse. What I find from my, uh, from my car mechanic is to tell me, not to tell me how to, uh, uh, what is the best route to get from here to Calgary perhaps, but how to mend my car. And so biologists, I think, need to get on with the job in hand in their professional work, not to pontificate about its ultimate meaning in their own scientific discourse and papers. So I myself will now distance myself from some of these early, earlier progressionist narratives were actually built into the biological narrative itself. I don't particularly think that's a, uh, a way that we should go. Now, indeed, given such a long history of ideological use and abuse of biology, as we were thinking last night, you might expect that uh, contemporary scientists and philosophers would be more cautious before investing evolution with ideological rhetoric. But as we all know, people don't learn from history, and the past decade has seen a resurgence of attempts to use evolution once again for various non-biological goals. And this has actually included a 180 degree turnaround from the earlier idea of progress in evolution to the complete rejection of any ideas of purpose or progress in the evolutionary process. The late paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould uh, was particularly robust in his attacks on the idea, writing, and I quote, that it is a noxious, culturally embedded, untestable, non-operational, intractable idea that must be replaced if we wish to understand the patterns of history. Close quote. So, I think he was against it. I think <laughs> it would be uh, fair to say. According to Gould, we are a momentary cosmic accident, or, albeit a glorious accident. Good to know that. Summing up his view, Gould writes, why back the tape of life to the early days of the Burgess Shale? Let it play again from an, an identical starting point, and the chance becomes vanishingly small that anything like human intelligence would grace the replay. Close quote. The philosopher Dan Dennett agrees. Dennett asks whether the complexity of biological diversity can really be the outcome of nothing but a cascade of algorithmic processes feeding on chance. And if so, who designed that cascade? Dennett answers his own rhetorical question by saying nobody. It is itself the product of a blind algorithmic process. Evolution, says Dennett, is not a process that was designed to produce us. A very clear statement. And here is Richard Dawkins on a rainy day, I think it must have been, in Oxford. And I quote, The universe we observe have precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Close quote. So, Gould, Dunnett, Dawkins, quite a number of other contemporary and very influential uh, cultural commentators are arguing that a proper understanding of the evolutionary process excludes any possibility even of understanding it as displaying any evidence of plan or of purpose. 
Indeed, they wish to go further than that. In his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, then it pictures evolution as a kind of universal acid, destroying in its path any basis for ultimate meaning and purpose in life. Darwin's dangerous idea, writes Dennett, is reductionism incarnate. So, what do we do if we're faced with these kinds of contemporary attempts to, again, invest evolution or any other scientific theory, for that matter, with such ideological interpretations? For I think, indeed, that is what they are. Now, the temptation, of course, is to go to the other extreme and to seek to invest evolution with some other rival ideology to counteract the first one in the event that we don't like the first one very much indeed. But my proposal today is that we shouldn't take that route. Instead, we should avoid using science altogether to prop up metaphysical or meta-scientific positions, which I think should be justified using their own forms of justification and rational discourse. We should seek to rescue Darwin from his various competing ideological kidnappers by helicopter, if necessary, if you can see the cartoon there. We should allow the theory of evolution to carry out its real task, which is, of course, to explain the origins of biological diversity, and that's it, no more and no less. And I think this in itself would be a fitting tribute to Darwin during his anniversary year, to remember him as the great biologist as he was, and not as a symbol of some ideology. But, whereas I am arguing against the investment of scientific theories with particular ideologies, I also think it's intriguing the way that advances within a particular scientific theory can itself make it more difficult for a particular metaphysical interpretation to be placed upon it. The advent of quantum mechanics has made it, I think, more difficult to believe in a strictly deterministic world. Advances in genetics over the past decade have made it more difficult to be a strict behavioural determinist. In a similar way, I wish to argue this evening that recent advances in evolution have made its metaphysical interpretations by writers such as Gould and Dennett appear less plausible. So what I'd like to argue now is not that our more recent scientific understandings of evolution actively supports any particular idea of progress. That, I think, would re represent just another ideological investment in the whole theory. But rather what I want to argue is that the science itself renders unlikely the idea that evolutionary history is incompatible with purpose, a rather different line of approach. In fact, I will suggest, contra Dennett, Gould, these other commentators, that recent insights into biological processes are in reality rather consistent with the complementary providentialist narrative which is provided by Christian theology. Now, biologists have long lived with the reality that their field of investigation, of course, is one of great complexity. This has led to a tradition of thinking that it's rather a messy research field, one devoid of general principles leading to firm predictions, one in which stochastic events dominate and have the final say. And it's precisely that kind of tradition that has nurtured this anti-providentialist uh, interpretation that Dennett and others wish to make. But I would suggest that the onset of genomics, the increased understanding of genes and development in the evolutionary process, so-called EVO-DEVO, uh, new insights into structural biology, the ability of computing power to elucidate the emergent properties of complex biological systems, these have all combined to give us a very different understanding of the evolutionary process than the one, than the one we had even a decade or so ago. I want to mention just five types of biological data that I think are relevant to this point. And the first is the rather obvious fact of the arrow of evolutionary time, an arrow associated with a striking increase in biological complexity. As I'm sure you know, there's strong evidence for the existence of cells by 3.5 billion years ago, pretty good evidence for life having already started by 3.8 billion years ago, but for the first two and a half billion years of evolution on this planet, life was really, really small, usually hardly bigger than one millimetre across, no bigger than a pinhead. There were no birds, no flowers, no animals wandering around, no fish in the sea. But at the genetic level, there was a huge amount going on. And so many of the genes that evolved at that time are indeed in our own bodies today. 
At the same time, you get the generation of many of the biochemical systems that later on were used to, to such effect to build the bigger, more interesting, if you like, living things that we see around us today. At the same time, we get the increase in oxygen in the atmosphere, without which multicellular and increasingly complex life would have probably been impossible to evolve. It's not until the advent of multicellular life, perhaps 1.2 billion years ago, perhaps much more recently than that, nobody really knows the date, but it's not until that point that living organisms start to get bigger, even though at the beginning they were only still on a scale of millimetres rather than centimetres, and only in the so-called Cambrian explosion during the period 505 to 525 million years ago do we find sponges and algae beginning now to grow up to 5 to 10 centimetres across, the size of animals then begins to increase dramatically from that time onwards until finally today uh, we have ourselves with our brains with our 10 to 11 neurons and 10 to 14 synaptic connections uh, the most complex known entities in the whole universe to the best of our knowledge so this evolutionary story as we stand back and look at it is certainly not a smooth trajectory but it's a narrative with long periods where not much, from our perspective, not much seemed to be happening, interspersed with these moments, if you like, moments in geological time of high drama when creative novelty burst upon the scene. And if you stand back and look at the process as a whole, I think the impression of progress is actually inescapable. As Sean Carroll from the University of Wisconsin-Madison remarks in a recent review in Nature, and I quote, Life's contingent history could be viewed as an argument, writes Carroll, as an argument against any direction or pattern in the course of evolution or the shape of life. But it's obvious that larger and more complex life forms have evolved from simple unicellular ancestors and that various innovations were necessary for the evolution of new means of living, close quote. Now Carroll's clearly choosing his words carefully here, but if pressed, every biologist has to admit that multicellular organisms are more complex than single cellular. Mammals are, in a sense, much more complex than yeast. The brain of a human is more complex than the brain of a mouse, and so on you could go. So I think it's, it, it's a little bit perverse, actually, to deny some form of directionality to the arrow of biological time, at least in terms of increased complexity. A second interesting observation that relates evolutionary biology to the idea of purpose is that underlying biological complexity are these networking principles that are turning out to be far fewer and simpler than they might have been. I mean, given that in every cell, complex networks of interaction occur between thousands of metabolites, proteins, DNA, and RNA, and so forth, I think actually that's quite surprising. As Yuri Allen from the Weizmann Institute again comments in this article in Nature, biological networks seem to be built to a good approximation from only a few types of patterns called network motifs. The same small set of network motifs discovered in bacteria have been found in gene regulation networks across diverse organisms, including plants and animals. Evolution seems to have rediscovered the same motifs again and again in different systems. I think we can link this to what Sean Carroll has called uh, deep homology. This means that if you look at uh, complex organs in animals such as limbs and eyes, in many cases it's possible to track back their evolutionary history to see how such structures arose by the modification of pre-existing genetic regulatory circuits established very early on in animal development. For example, the evolution of the vertebrate camera eyes from Carroll's illustrating here shows that some of the molecular machinery was really present in a closely related form in the fruit fly, Drosophila, which has a quite, uh, albeit quite different type of eye, the compound eye, and the various molecules. We don't want to get too technical this evening. I realize that many of us are not from biological backgrounds, but I just want to mention this rather fine series of six articles that was published in Nature a couple of weeks ago um, in the February the 12th issue, actually, exactly two weeks ago today, wasn't it? February the 12th. And uh, there's one there about deep homology by Sean Carroll. If you want six nice, pretty accessible articles on current evolutionary thinking, I would uh, recommend those uh, six articles in that issue of Nature. Unity of the biosphere has also been underlined by greater understanding of how genetic information flows. The importance of 
horizontal gene transfer has been now uh, well recognized, the transfer of genetic information uh, between different organisms, especially from one bacterium to another, or indeed from viruses to bacteria. Microbes, it turns out, are like gene swapping collectives, to use the rather evocative phrase of, uh, of Carl Vers. Last year, an extensive study was published of more than half a million genes from 180 one different types of bacteria. 80% of them showed signs of lateral gene transfer. That's where bacteria actually swap their good tricks. You know, it's like kids swapping stamps. So you get a good stamp, you swap it. And that's what many organisms do. Bacterial viruses are used as repositories of genetic information that can be used to reconstruct their genomes under certain circumstances. As well as comments, it seems that there is a continuity of energy flux and informational transfer from the genome up through cells, community, virusphere, and environment. Lateral gene transfer has also been de demonstrated now in many higher organisms, including animals and plants as well. A paper from the Craig Venter Institute came out in Science recently regarding a parasitic bacteria called Wolbachia, which infects a high proportion of insects as well as other invertebrates. The paper reports that uh, a fruit fly, this is the famous Drosophila again, actually contains the complete genome. The genome, by the way, is just the sum total of the genetic information in a given organism. So the, the Drosophila actually contains a complete copy and paste, if you like, genome from Volbachia in its own genome. That's about a million base pairs. That's the letters of the, uh, the genetic alphabet. That's actually incorporated into one of its chromosomes. Many other organisms, it turns out, such as bees and worms, were also found to contain Wolbachia genes, some of which are active in making RNA. That means they might have a functional role in those living organisms. So this provides yet another way in which information can be passed on from one genome to another during the course of evolution. If you like, the process of evolution is a communal exercise, one step leading to another with everything depending upon everything else. Obviously, the reason we're sitting here this evening, we are ultimately dependent upon evolution of genes that was going on not millions, but billions of years ago. I think it's a, a fascinating thought. The lateral gene transfer, of course, means that the tree of life, or perhaps better, the bush of life, is only a kind of partially correct view of the evolutionary process. This shows um, on your right, uh, sorry, on your left-hand side, the only figure in the Origin of Species. I mean, it wasn't exactly full of exciting figures, and you probably don't think that figure is particularly exciting. But this actually shows the early version of the famous sort of evolutionary tree. But once you accept, of course, lateral gene transfer into your repertoire of evolutionary mechanisms, then the tree or the bush looks actually slightly less helpful as a way of picturing evolution. What you now have is a giant gene-swapping collective here. These early billions of years of evolution, the lateral gene transfer um, kind of era, if you like. And then you have a much smaller bush, I would prefer to call it, rather than tree, which really only refers to the recent evolution since the Cambrian explosion. And uh, I think this is giving us a rather different picture, really, of the way that evolution occurs. Verse himself talks about things going below the Darwinian horizon meaning that when you get to a lot of lateral gene transfer, you know, the whole system really gets very different indeed. So the few hundred or so genomes that have been sequenced so far are giving us some really remarkable new insights into the ways in which genomes gain and indeed lose and utilize novel information. The evolutionary history of biological life is a story about information flow, flowing along evolutionary lineages in all kinds of different ways. And the more we understand them, I think the more fascinating the story becomes. Something a little bit different. The very limited array of protein structures used by living organisms compared to the astronomically huge number of possible structures is also, I think, very striking indeed as a biochemist. Proteins, as um, you, you probably know, are made up of a specified sequence of 20 different amino acids, and a single protein may contain hundreds of an amino acids, generating billions and billions of possible sequences. If you think of randomizing 20, um, stat you know, the maths people there can do it, I'm sure, very quickly on the back of an envelope. It's a very large cosmological number, indeed, of all the possible protein structures you might have. Yet, if you look at all the known protein structures, uh, in the world of all the proteins that we know about so far. And if you look at their structural, their 
structural motifs based on all the genomes that have been sequenced so far, you find actually that the great majority can be assigned um, to only 1,400 protein domain families. In other words, and these are all the squiggles here are just the different motifs, structural motifs, and hundreds of others um, that you can find if you are a protein biochemist doing structural work and so forth. What it means is that all living things are united, not only by having the same genetic code, but also by possessing an elegant and highly restricted set of protein structures. One is almost tempted, almost, to use the word platonic in describing this remarkably limited repertoire of motifs. And much recent literature suggests also that proteins can only evolve along certain quite restricted pathways because of these internal constraints which are built into their own structures. Here's just one example. Um, it's a, a group from Harvard. Again, a bit technical to go in now, but I think the title tells you uh, all you need to know. Darwinian evolution can follow only very few mutational paths to fitter proteins. But notice what the authors say in that final sentence of their abstract in their science paper. We conclude that much protein evolution will be similarly constrained. This implies that the protein type of life may be largely reproducible and even predictable. So-called fitness landscapes play an important role in evolutionary discourse. These traditionally represent topographical pictures of the adaptation of different populations to local ecological niches, but here is an example, again published in Nature um, quite recently, on fitness landscapes applied to enzyme, structure and function. And again it turns out that the evolutionary pathways to arrive at a particular function of a particular enzyme are remarkably constrained. As the authors conclude again, that only a few paths are favoured also implies that evolution might be more reproducible than is commonly perceived or even predictable, close quote. Now, when I was first learning my evolution um, back in those heady days of the 1960s, that kind of comment would have been deemed, uh, I would say, heretical um, and certainly uh, quite out of bounds, really, as a kind of language that biochemists and biologists should use. But it's now cropping up quite frequently, actually, just in the, in the daily sort of biochemical literature. The fifth type of biological data that are highly relevant to the question of purpose in the evolutionary narrative relates to the phenomenon of convergence. Convergence refers to the repeated evolution in independent, independent evolutionary lineages of the same organ, the same evolutionary pathway, sometimes the same chemical being placed in the same position in a particular biochemical pathway, or maybe a similar structure, a similar adaptation. Simon Conway Morris, uh, who's a professor of paleobiology in Cambridge, has recently drawn attention to this great phenomenon of convergence in his fine book, Life Solution, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe, published a few years ago. And here's just a few of the examples, the many examples from his book. The convergence and mimicry of insects and spiders to an ant morphology has evolved at least 70 times independently. Compound and camerize taken together have evolved more than 20 times uh, during the course of evolution. So the take a message from all, all these sort of discourse is that if you live in a planet of light and darkness, then you need eyes to get around, and eyes are what you are likely to get if you're in the right ecological niche and wait around for a bit, like a few million years. And in a commentary on Gould's idea of contingency that we cited earlier, Professor Kwame Morris writes, and I quote, that it is now widely thought that the history of life is little more than a contingent muddle punctuated by disastrous mass extinctions that in spreading the doom of one group so open the doors of opportunity to some other mob of lucky chances. Rerun the tape of the history of life. Of course, he's quoting from Gould here. Rerun the tape of the history of life and the end result will be an utterly different biosphere. More, most notably, there will be nothing remotely like a human. Yet, Morris claims, what we know of evolution suggests the exact reverse. Convergence is ubiquitous, and the constraints of life make the emergence of the various biological properties, e.g. intelligence, very probable, if not inevitable. Close quote. Islands provide very good locations for investigating the phenomenon of convergence. And one of those six essays that I mentioned in the February 12th issue of Nature is all about evolution on islands. Again, I, I really recommend the article. 
And of course it was Darwin's five weeks, only five weeks, spent on the Galapagos Islands uh, that were so critical in the development of his own theory of natural selection. But the authors of the, the Nature article highlight the fact that island evolution illustrates very nicely the interplay between chance and necessity during the evolutionary process. As the authors mention almost in passing, many island radiations have produced species resembling forms that evolved independently elsewhere. That is, evolution had similar outcomes, disparate origins notwithstanding. So islands sort of provide you, if you like, with test tube experiments where you can actually compare across a great a range of different uh, types of island. So the point about convergence is not that identical organisms evolve, don't get the wrong idea here, but rather that similar adaptations evolve independently in those species that occupy similar ecological niches. And this rather predictable aspect of evolution is also well illustrated by the evolution of loss of flight, which occurred on islands such as New Zealand, where there are no predators. And so you have had in New Zealand 10 species at least of of flightless mowers. You had other flightless birds um, as well in New Zealand before they sadly went extinct on the island of Mauritius. There was the famous dodo, which went extinct back in the 17th century. Why fly when you don't need to? So you will lose your wings. And again, it's an example actually of convergent evolution. Loss of, uh, loss of organs as well is an adaptation as well as gaining new ones. And I think it's interesting to read Mark Pagel's introductory commentary to those six nature essays that I keep mentioning, entitled Natural Selection 150 Years On, where he comments that contingency does not seem to be the pervasive force that Gould suspected. So, yes, the rolling of the genetic dice, if you like, is a wonderful way of generating both novelty and diversity, but at the same time it appears to be restrained by necessity to a relatively limited number of living entities. If you live in a universe with this kind of physics and this kind of chemistry and on a planet with these particular properties, then this is what you're likely to get. And so what we're doing here in this very simple kind of model is imagining uh, all the possible genomes represented by red boxes uh, which could potentially, let's take just the 22,000 human genes and randomize them and come up with all the potential genomes that you might be able to have from those. Most of them are sterile. Most of them will not produce a living organism that will flourish in a particular ecological niche on planet Earth. So a very limited number of genomes will actually do that job. Those are the green boxes. So in a sense, what evolution is doing is exploring design space, is exploring the various spaces, if you like, of design space on this planet and filling them up with organisms. And those are the green boxes. And that's what we study, in a sense, in evolutionary biology, is, uh, is th this, these uh, lineages coming down of those organisms that flourished and passed on their genes to the next generation um, in, in varying forms and so forth. So biological diversity is definitely not a case of anything can happen. It's not true. Only certain things can happen here on planet Earth. So far from looking stochastic and random in the way that Gould suggested, evolution looks very highly organized and even directional, as I say, leading towards increased complexity. And so we've just done a very quick tour, really, and we could go on on lots of other examples, but we just looked at five ways in which recent insights into the process of evolution are consistent with this rather plan-like character of life on this planet. The arrow of evolutionary time leading to increased complexity, this rather restrained set of networking principles which uh, appear to underline uh, biological complexity, the fact that evolution is an interconnected communal process uh, characterized by this very high degree of information flow, the high level of constraint on protein evolution and structure, and then this very striking phenomenon of convergence. I don't think we can really say that the biological diversity we observe is inevitable, for obviously our experience of life is based on exactly n equals 1, but remembering that the universe is likely to have a uniform biochemistry, the data so far, I think, suggests that life anywhere in the universe might look rather similar. And this, I think, seems to be perhaps more consistent with a providentialist account for the overall meaning of biological diversity, including ourselves, in which it's perfectly possible to believe in a God who has intentions and purposes for the universe, 
and perhaps render somewhat less plausible the claims made by Gould, Dennett and others that evolutionary history is a totally random walk that might have ended up quite differently. It doesn't seem to look like that from the data that we have so far. In fact, I would go a little bit further than that. I think it's intriguing to suggest or to note that just as religious believers have often utilised disastrous God of the gaps type, type of arguments that seek to place their argument for God in the present gap in our scientific knowledge, so it's possible that here we have an atheism of the gaps type of argument in which atheists seek to support their disbelief in God based on interpretations of scientific data which appear initially plausible due to lack of knowledge about the data but perhaps appear less believable as our understanding of the process, in this case the evolutionary process, becomes more complete. I just throw that out as an idea. Is there any way in which the word inevitable might become more persuasive? In principle, I think, there clearly is. And that is if we found different examples of life around on several different planets, and in turn found that life actually did look biologically rather similar to our own, which my personal guess is that it probably would. The more we find biological life similar to ours, of course, the more we might be likely to say that the kind of biology we experience on this planet is actually inevitable. That's the way it just has to be. Now, of course, we've never yet even found one example of life on other planets yet, but during the coming decades and centuries, if humanity survives that long, which is a bit of a question mark, but my own guess is that such discoveries will actually be uh, quite likely. With the NASA Mars rover due to arrive in Mars later this year, specifically designed to look for evidence for life, either fossil, more likely, or perhaps even living, who knows, that day might come sooner than we think. Furthermore, the NASA's Kepler mission is due to be launched exactly a week today. Very exciting. And it's designed to search for Earth-sized planets by looking at about 100,000 stars in the Milky Way and then recording when they dim slightly due to the passage of a planet in front of their faces. The mission's prime aim is to find these Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone, or the Goldilocks zone, as some people call it, where the conditions could be right for life. So far, we've detected a little more than 300 planets in our own galaxy, but many are gas giants and so unable to support life. At a recent conference, you might have read this, Dr. Alan Boss from the Carnegie Institution of Science claimed that there could be as many as 100 billion planets like Earth in our universe, and if that were the case, then the scope for at least some of these planets supporting life becomes really quite high. Well, I guess the Kepler mission will make a good start in testing some of these more expansive claims uh, people, uh, made by people like Dr. Boss and so forth. Now, so far we've talked about, in these rather vague terms, about the nature of the evolutionary process being consistent with, quotes, um, the idea of an overall purpose to the narrative. But I, I want to take this now, in the last part of the lecture, a little bit further than that, and see where the comments of Blaise Pascal um, might fit in um, to our whole narrative discussion this evening. In his book, um, Les Pensées, Pascal argued for what I would call a weak form of natural theology. That's the idea that once you believe in God, for other reasons, and uh, you then, of course, see the world through theistic spectacles, as it were, and the properties of the world, in that case, then indeed do make better sense than when viewed through non-theistic spectacles. Whereas a, a strong view of natural theology would rather argue um, that the existence or even characteristics of God can be derived itself, or themselves, from the properties of the world. Well, here's what Pascal said um, about this weak form of natural theology, and I quote here um, from Les Pensées. In addressing the argument to infidels, now, Pascal is talking about the natural theologians. He's referring to current writers. Their first chapter is to prove divinity from the works of nature. I should not be astonished at their enterprise if they were addressing their argument to the faithful, for it is certain that those who have the living faith in their hearts see at once that all existence is another, none other than the work of the God whom they adore. So here Pascal is clearly approving of this sort of weak form of natural theology. But then he goes on to say, with regard to the stronger form of natural theology, but for those in whom this light is extinguished, 
people who are coming to it from a more sceptical perspective, to tell them that they have only to look at the smallest things which surround them, and they will see God openly, is to give them ground for believing that the proofs of our religion are very weak. And I see by reason and experience and nothing is more calculated to arouse their contempt. It is not after this manner that scripture speaks, which has a better knowledge of the things that are of God. It says, on the contrary, that God is a hidden God, and that since the corruption of nature, he has left man in a darkness from which they can escape only through Jesus Christ, without whom all communion with God is cut off. Close quote. So clearly what Pascal is doing here is to kind of downgrade a strong form of natural theology in favour of an emphasis on revelation, in particular the revelation of Christ that we receive in the scriptures. Now I personally have a great deal of sympathy with Pascal's insight. I think again of Dawkins looking at the evolutionary process with his atheist dark glasses on as a process of blind, pitiless indifference. Well, I guess yes. If you look at the process of evolution itself, then with those glasses on, I guess it's not going to persuade you that there's a God who created it and brought it all into being. But conversely, neither do I think that there's anything derivable from the evolutionary process that is incompatible with such a belief. I just don't think that scientific theories can adjudicate between rival metaphysical models in that kind of way. Rather, I think we bring, we all bring, our prior metaphysical beliefs to the evolutionary narrative and we interpret it accordingly. Of course, Dawkins will see only blind, pitiless indifference, for that is what his prior atheistic presupposition delivers. With that starting point, how could it be otherwise? But what about those who come to evolution with their theistic spectacles on? Those who have perhaps found faith in Christ, as Pascal says, through whom all things were made as the Apostle John says in the prologue of his Gospel. And so those theists will then interpret evolution within the framework of a creator God who has intentions and purposes for his creation. Are there now aspects of the evolutionary narrative that are particularly consonant with or relevant to their specifically Christian faith? Aspects over and above the general notion of purpose and directionality that we've been considering so far. I think there are, and I just want to mention four specific examples of that. First, it's interesting to note the way that some theologians in the 19th century welcomed evolution because they felt that it acted as an important corrective to that very strong form of natural theology of the earlier part of the century, popularised by writers such as Archdeacon William Paley, from whom we were quoting last night. Paley's rationalistic, orderly faith was the one that Darwin absorbed at Cambridge whilst he was studying divinity, but then subsequently lost over the following decades of his life. And Paley's famous argument about the design of the watch pointing to a heavenly watchmaker was already being critiqued by Christian theologians long before Darwin's Origin of Species was published because it tended to picture the idea of God as a rather remote uh, heavenly watchmaker or mechanic rather than the personally involved Trinitarian God of traditional Christian theology. (coughs) Last night we quoted from Aubrey Moore, a fellow of St. John's College, Oxford, curator of the Oxford Botanical Gardens. I hope you don't mind if I quote from him again because I think he makes this point so well. And Moore claimed that Darwinism had done the church a great service in helping to rid itself of these more extreme forms of natural theology. And he claimed that Darwinism appeared as under the guise of a foe and did the work of a friend. And the reason for that, said Moore, was because um, Darwinism actually takes us back to much more of an imminent understanding of God's work in the created order, arguing that there are not and cannot be any divine interpositions in nature, for God cannot interfere with himself. His creative activity is present everywhere. There is no division of labour between God and nature, or God and law. For the Christian theologians said more, the facts of nature are the acts of God. He was actually quoting from Augustine there almost. There's a very similar quote in Augustine's great commentary on Genesis, published in 405 AD. It's often been said that Darwin helped the theologians to disinfect Christian theology of an imbalance in its understanding of God as creator. And today it's surely no accident that the anti-Darwinian intelligent design movement tends to generate 
Once again, the notion of a heavenly engineer occasionally tinkering around with nature to start up the genetic code or create the first cell or make complex entities like the bacterial flagellum. But what we tend to end up with in this way of thinking is a designer of the gaps, a designer who becomes redundant as soon as the current gaps in our scientific knowledge are filled. This is very different from the biblical emphasis on the imminence of God, whereby all that exists without exception only continues to do so because of his continued say-so. In this view, the properties of matter continue to be what they are because God wills that they should continue to have such properties. It is, then, what makes science possible. God is both the composer and conductor, if you like, in this ongoing music of life. All that we can do as scientists is to try and describe and understand God's music as best we can. A second valuable corrective, I think, that comes from the evolutionary narrative is the way in which we, humanity, are all intimately linked to the rest of the created order. Our bodies contain the indelible marks of our evolutionary history. We are all walking fossil genetic museums. We all have the same genetic code as found in all other organisms. Regulation of the division of the cells and our bodies is carried out using the very similar molecular apparatus to that which you find in yeast and other uh, organisms. Certainly, we are the only ones that Genesis makes clear are made in God's image, but we're still made from the dust. We share in the earthiness of the rest of creation. I think that's important because in fulfilling our mandate to care for the earth, another key teaching from Genesis, we can never do this as though we were somehow separate from that for which we care. Pre-Darwinian views of the fixity of the species could nurture a view of humans as lording it over creation as if somehow separate from the created order. But knowing now as we do how intimately we are part of evolutionary history helps counteract that kind of arrogant tendency. Third, an understanding of the evolutionary process I think can shed light, some light, on the age-old problem of a so-called natural evil. Carbon-based life is a package deal that comes with great benefits, but also, of course, with great costs. Genetic variation is a mixed blessing. Without it, there would be no variation. We wouldn't be here. Without it, we would all be one giant clone. For it is, of course, that variation in one out of every thousand, on average, of the nucleotide bases in our DNA that helps us make the unique, makes us into the unique human beings that we all are. But, of course, there is an inevitable dark side of this evolutionary process. That same genetic variation which brings life and diversity can also bring cancer and the suffering of genetic diseases. But these are integral aspects of carbon-based life. We simply cannot have one without the other. We are reminded of those words of the great uh, Oxford theologian Austin Farrow of a previous generation. Poor limping world, why does not your kind creator pull the thorn out of your paw? But what sort of thorn is this? And if it were pulled out, how much of the poor would remain? How much indeed of creation? What would a physical universe be like from which all mutual interference of systems was removed? It would be no physical universe at all. Carbon-based life is, of course, impossible without death. No multicellular animal can live by deriving all its energy needs from chemical elements. All are completely dependent on these food chains whereby organic molecules synthesized in other organisms are passed on to them. I think also we sometimes forget the massive scale of death on this planet. We have tenfold more bacteria in our bodies than we do our own cells, but that's nothing compared to the estimated 5 times 10 to the 30, just repeat that, 5 times 10 to the 30 bacteria in the world, more than 92% living underground, and weighing roughly equivalent to all the plants in the world. That's certainly a lot more than the 10 to the 22 stars in the universe. It involves a huge amount of daily death. Now, if you don't care very much about uh, bacterial death, then just think of the extinction of the 99% of species that ever lived, the sheer scale of death that is intrinsic to the evolutionary process. Or if that doesn't touch you, then think of the roughly 155,000 human deaths every day 
or nearly 100 knees every minute. Here's the cheerful thought for this evening. If you stack the number of human bodies that die every day on top of each other, the power would stretch about 30 miles up into the sky. That's every day. I said this would be a cheerful lecture. You know, so. <laughs> so, there's this huge amount of coming and going on this planet. This great escalator of life is bearing us all onwards through the inevitable march of time. And we can't jump off. We don't have an op option. We're on the escalator. We're all an integral part of that process. And that in itself, I think, brings us to the fourth way in which the evolution process can have the effect of resonating with various Christian doctrines. And in this case, it's that great Christian hope of a new heavens and a new earth. Now, it's clear within the Christian framework that this world has been designed with transient occupation in mind. Now, that does not mean that we shouldn't look after it carefully and care for it. And there's a great uh, stewardship mandate there to care for the earth. But many transient things are more precious, actually, than long-lasting things. So when I say transient, let's not think that we're downgrading the present world in which we live. Not at all. But for the Christian, the present world is completely incoherent without its ultimate transformation and fulfillment in the new heavens and the new earth. So in that broader narrative, evolutionary history becomes one aspect of a great meta-narrative, if you like, in which God has particular intentions and purposes for bringing precisely this kind of universe into being with its anthropic fruitfulness and potentiality for knowing and serving God through and indeed in the midst of suffering. So as Aubrey Moore says, for the Christian, evolution under the guise of a foe indeed does the work of a friend. Reminding us of the imminence of God in creation, highlighting the fact that we're an integral part of creation, not separate from it, showing us how the dark face of evolution is not arbitrarily imposed, but it's an essential cost of living in a carbon-based world. And also highlighting the transient nature of all life on this planet, reminding us of our great eschatological hope in the new heavens and the new earth, where there will be no more death. I'd like to close with a reflection from a theologian uh, who was at Princeton Theological Seminary, Diogenes Allen, in some words that I think Pascal would have approved of. Through Christ, wrote Allen, it is possible to understand how the Father's love is present in all things, even in suffering. Suffering can be regarded as a mark of our distance from God because we are subject to the cosmos simply by being creatures. Yet, depending on a person's response to suffering, a person can be in contact with God through their suffering and in suffering. To be in touch with the reality God has made, even when it is a painful touch, is to have indirect contact with him who is above it and who is above all else, love. Insofar it is contact, it is good. Insofar as it is painful, it is not but what a difference when the same pain results from the grip of a friend and not from the mindless grip of nature. Thank you for your attention. My name is Margie Patrick and I am a PhD student in the Department of Religious Studies here at the University of Waterloo and I am a member of the planning committee for this year's Pascal Lectures. I would like to thank Dr. Alexander for a very informative and wide-ranging lecture. Uh, we were reminded of the distinctions between science and ideology and uh, for how science can actually support the providentialist narrative. Uh, Dr. Alexander suggested that life the way that we know it is perhaps inevitable and that um, aspects of the evolutionary narrative can even uh, support Christian doctrine. Um, Dr. Alexander has agreed to take some questions, and I will just moderate that session. Yes, go ahead, please. Stand up so people can hear me. In fact, uh, I had expected a somewhat different lecture in the sense that Darwin's theory seems to one in which organisms and the organs don't have purposes like teeth don't have purposes and uh, 
the liver doesn't have a purpose, and so on and so forth. Which is not what you were talking about. You were talking about the purpose of the universe or something of that sort. But I'll, I'd like to ask a question about the first aspect. There was an ancient uh, philosopher who actually came up with the theory of natural selection, though it was not had none of the empirical information that Darwin had, and his name was Empedocles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he argued that what came about came about by chance uh, reactions, uh, chance events. And Aristotle criticized his view, uh, and he said, well, how can you get teeth then that, you know, you always get the teeth that are in the mouth for chewing? or eyes and other sorts of things. Now, Aristotle did not think there was a creator of the universe, and he didn't think there was design in the universe, but he did think there were purposes in nature. Mm -hmm. I have heard that Darwin said that Aristotle was the greatest biologist who ever lived, and I was wondering if you had any comments whatsoever about this Aristotelian theory and if you know what Darwin uh, said about Aristotle. Hmm. Thank you, right. I, I, can't, uh, I don't know what Darwin said about Aristotle. I, I couldn't quote you any text on that, I'm sorry. Um, professional historians might be able to do that. But I think certainly, yeah, Aristotle has a very major place in the history of biology and, you know, for his early uh, observations in embryology uh, and so forth, which became eventually... I mean, ironically, his, um, his works, his biological works, were translated rather late, actually, in, in the whole corpus of classical studies, which were translated from... Arabic or from, from Greek um, into medieval Europe. So the biological texts became available sort of relatively late, but they were certainly all there by, obviously, by Darwin's time. Um, yeah, I, I think he was a wonderful observational biologist. Of course, um, like the Greek science, it was lacking in that empirical foundation, as you, as you, as you mentioned. Um, and I think I mean, Darwin himself, in a later, in the sixth edition, actually, of The Origin of Species, brought in much more material about the precursors of, uh, of natural selection and so forth. He didn't go back to Empedocles, actually, I don't think. But he certainly mentioned, you know, his own grandfather and, and uh, people like Lamarck. He, I think he'd been criticized for not actually mentioning, you know, these sort of precursors. So I think evolution in one sense was in the air, um, but it just lacked a mechanism. It lacked sort of real biological foundations and justification. On your earlier point, I think it's interesting that... Um, I mean, biology has always been very teleological, uh, historically, you know, the telos. I mean, because biological things, you know, when you just look at living things, they clearly have a telos, you know. I mean, livers are made for, they do have purposes, you know, <laughs> lots of different purposes, um, not least for metabolizing alcohol and all those important things, you know, that they do for us, uh, even this evening. So, so it's a very teleological organ, you could say. So I think there's always been this... Um, you know, uh, kind of swings between anti-theological and pro-theological sort of themes within the history of biology and, and I wouldn't want to go you know, swing away to a very teleological discourse of biology and that's not where I wanted to go this evening. And what I wanted to really say is that I think the recent understanding of evolutionary biology um, can actually counteract strongly anti-teleological anti-providential uh, interpretations of evolution. So I, I'm putting the argument in a rather cautious way, actually. Uh, you know, I, I'm British, so I mean, what do you expect? I, mean, you know, I wouldn't want to come out too strongly, you know, on one side or the other, but, you know. But it just seems to me, you know, that if you have a very strongly anti-theological discourse, it just doesn't fit, you know, with, with the kind of biology we're looking at today. I mean, it's just not the way that evolutionary biology is going. Um, it, it's not this great randomized sort of... It, it's chance and necessity, but necessity does seem to have the upper hand, you know. So it's constraining the creativity of chance through, through channels, you know, through design space. I mean, that's the way it looks, anyway. So um, that doesn't support this very strongly anti-teleological discourse. That, that's what I'm really trying to get at. So it, it leaves the rest of it wide open. How you interpret it leaves it wide open. Okay. Uh, I guess last night you were at pains to uh, try to disengage and decouple uh, Darwinism metaphysical conclusions uh, mm -hmm. and ideological ones. And uh, tonight you are uh, kind of keeping that line, it seems, 
but uh, it's unclear to me whether you're suggesting that uh, there are there is evidence in evolution or Darwin, Darwinian theory for the Christian view, or you're sticking with your decoupling uh, to sort of emphasize the compatibility. So in one so, so, so in one sense. Um, of course, logically, if the two are to be kept independent, they do with different spheres, they're going to be compatible. Mm-hmm. But aren't you really ending tonight by suggesting that they're not really totally decoupled? There really is a growing consensus in modern evolutionary empirical thought that is suggestive, if not evidence, of the Christian perspective. So, so which is it? Is it just mm-hmm. two different spheres? Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, and, and I, I have been trying to steer, you know, a quite careful course, <laughs> as you sort of rightly detected. Um, so I think I would want to end up by saying that, you know, the way we write our scientific paper, I mean, okay, so biologists, let's go back one step. You know, scientists are really not philosophers. I know there's lots of proper philosophers here this evening, and, and you know, we biologists are not really philosophers, so, but what we tend to argue in our scientific papers is, you know, here's a data set. Um, and then we use this language of consistent with all the time, perhaps boringly so, in the discussion section of our papers. And of course, our data are consistent with, you know, our favorite model, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't publish. So, you know, that's the kind of language that we feel comfortable with. Now, of course, some data can be more or less consistent with. Okay, now, I can point to things in the evolutionary discourse death, suffering, you know, things that a lot of people just feel are incompatible with the notion of a God of love. So it's not. It's, it's an ambiguous story. You know, you can't just derive, you certainly can't derive Christian theology by looking at the evolutionary process. I certainly, I'm with Pascal, you see, on that one. Okay, I don't think you can derive knowledge of God by, by simply looking at, let's say, this mechanism of evolution. But I do think that you can take up this, what I call the weak natural theology position, which I think Pascal is favoring, which is to say, well, actually, here's a discourse which is you know, pretty consistent with a, you know, a historical Christian perspective on things. I mean, you know, if, if there is a God, as I believe as a Christian, who has intentions and purposes in bringing about, you know, intelligent human beings who will respond to his love by free choice, who will have moral uh, abilities, that they can make moral choices, well, you know, that looks like that's what the evolutionary process is delivering, and it does seem to have this arrow of evolutionary, you know, of, of time and so forth. Uh, we can't say it's inevitable because n equals one. You know, how can you say it's inevitable when we've only got one example? But the likelihood is, you know, we might find beings not, perhaps not dissimilar to us actually, you know, on other planets if they had enough time to be there, they hadn't destroyed themselves, if they had the right window of their history. So it's quite possible. So I think in that sense, it seems to me, you know, quite consistent with. So that's why I'm going for this sort of, if you like, it's a weak natural theology, if you want to give it a label. Um, but I certainly wouldn't want to suggest you can somehow derive knowledge of God or knowledge about God, you know, from just a, a biological process. I, I wouldn't want to do that. So I don't know if that helps. Yes. What would really be interesting if it were inconsistent with some other metaphysical Yes. Well, you see. Words, maybe it's, just, maybe it's uh-huh. consistent with all metaphysical. Mm-hmm. I would want, yeah, I think it's a very good point. I, I would want to answer yes and no to that. Okay, so the yes is certainly, I think you can absorb, you can certainly absorb evolution into any religion you want. I mean, no problem, unless it was young earth creationism. Then you can't. Okay, that's the exception. Okay, so, but I mean, in terms of general religious systems or philosophies, you can absorb it, no problem at all. Or atheism, yeah, sure. So, but um, if you have people like Dennett and like Gould who are taking up, who actually are deriving a very anti-providentialist philosophy, I think, really from, you know, from the evolutionary process, then I think the data actually can count against that. So I see the data can count against certain metaphysical views more than it can do being in favor of, especially in some ways, okay. So, so I think that, uh, that's where I was trying to go. That actually, I think if you had people like that, had this very strongly uh, oh well it's all stochastic and it's all random and it could have been we could have not been here it could have ended up com- completely differently well, I say as a biologist it doesn't look that way so the biological data actually seems to be counteracting that kind of view so I think it plays more that kind of role more a, a refutable you know refutation role <laughs> rather than the other way around 
Um, so that, that's the sort of line I would want to take. I think it's steering a middle course. Um, both you and Conway Mara seem to view the evolution of intelligence, particularly human style intelligence, as inevitable. So I'd like to know how you reconcile this with the fact that human style intelligence only arose after 99.9% of Earth's history. So mm -hmm. if we were having this discussion, let's say, 65 million years ago, we'd all be sitting around congratulating ourselves on uh, the inevitability of velociraptors mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and you know, that we're the pinnacle of, of the creation. So how do you reconcile the fact that the, the vast majority of, of Earth's history didn't have precisely what you think is inevitable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was careful not to say that I believed in inevitable. You know, I don't think it's... I, I don't think we can say it's inevitable. And Simon Oppressed, I mean, he's a good friend of mine, wouldn't say it's inevitable. I mean, in the, in the title, it helps to sell books. I'm mean, being a bit unkind here, but, you know, it, it, it's a strong statement to get people people thinking. I don't think we can say that human life is inevitable, speaking biologically. How, how could we do that? N equals one. You know, you can't say. So, I don't think that. But, I think that um, the way it sort of looked, okay, so plus or minus a million years, a billion years here, you know, what happened if the asteroid hadn't wiped out the dinosaurs, you know, life history would have been different, and so forth. But I, I think more the point is that if, if you ha do have sufficient time for a planet in the Goldilocks zone, if you like, um, it sort of looks as if eventually, you know, there is this arms race, you know, where uh, organisms do increase in complexity and intelligence. I mean, based on just the history we know about, we only have n equals one type of history to look at. But it seems quite likely, you know, that, that it's moving on to the, you know, to the sort of animals that have greater intelligence and so forth. And clearly there are many animals that have tremendous intelligence and they're, they're intelligent in their particular zone, their particular ecological niche. We're very un unintelligent in the sea, for example, you know. Uh, so, so in other words, intelligence is defined also by our own environment, our own ecological niche and where we live and so forth. So I do take your point. I don't think we can say that we're inevitable. But I think the you know, the phenomenon of convergence is very striking and the way that thing, animals in different continents do occupy niches and end up looking very similar. If you, you know, take the placentals and the marsupials and you just look at their independent evolution and they all end up looking actually quite similar, you know. So you get uh, very similar looking animals. So, so that, that seems to, it's suggestive, I think. I, so I would want to use the word perhaps suggestive as a weaker word, not the word inevitable myself. Actually. So I, I think you're critique is well made, you know, and, and, but, you know, if we, we, if we find, you know, a few other examples of life, then I think we'd be in a stronger position, and, and my position might become weaker, you know, it might counter it, my position. We might find a planet that's been running, you know, for four billion years, and looks pretty suitable for life, and it's never got beyond bacteria. That's possible. You know, bacteria are highly successful, so it's not impossible. So I think, you know, we need more data. So, uh, Yes. About the, uh, pile of oh! 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 <laughs> How old are your boys? Uh, <laughs> they sleep well. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I, this is a sort of rough back of the envelope. You know, it, I mean, if someone claimed it's 28 miles, I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to argue with them. You know, it's just to give a rough idea. You know, so. But it, it is apparently about 155,000 a day. Yeah, people dying. So that's quite a lot. It yes. on how you stack them? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. I wanted to, not the last, but the next to the last question, sort of in reverse. Uh, you were pointing out the arrow time and evolution seems to be going at an accelerating rate. And of course, that leaves us wondering what will happen. Future mm -hmm. um, and in some sense in the, in the near future, since the rate is accelerating. So, do you have any thoughts on that? Right. No, it's a very good question. Uh, I think everyone, the, the question is about is there going to be continuing human evolution? I mean, there are clearly genes um, under which are being selected in the human population, um, which are under selection pressure. And generally, they're genes to do with pathogens, as you might expect, which give people resistant to pathogens in certain parts of the world. So, so there is, you know, human evolution is continuing if you're looking at variation between genomes. Um, but of course, that shouldn't be understood to mean, you know, 
speciation is around the corner, not at all. Now, there's some very good biological arguments against the possibility that speciation, further speciation might occur. One of fact, of course, is that we are now, well, I, I say as a Christian, of course, practicing the teaching of Jesus to care for people who are, who, let's say, a century ago or two centuries ago would not have reached reproductive age. So we are, we are preserving genes that would have been weeded out in earlier generations by medical care. I mean, we are, we are counteracting, if you like, the struggle for survival in that sense for entirely good and excellent reasons. So there's an irony here, you know, that actually the care, you know, of humans for each other is, is helping, if you like, to slow down that evolutionary process. That's, that's one point. Another point is um, the fact for speciation to occur, you probably need isolated populations. And um, now we're in a global village, you know, where people kind of mixing up their genes all the time. So, I mean, it's very, very... Um, it would be impossible to think, you know, you would have a human population that would be isolated long enough to actually speciate. So you have to create sort of science fiction scenarios where we send, uh, you know, a team of people to Mars to live there for a good 10,000 years, let's say. Um, and there, there might be a possibility for speciation. You know, people in a very different environment, you know, living for a very long time, I mean, reproducing for a very long time in that environment. So that that's the kind of biological context, but it's simply not a context that one can imagine outside of science fiction for the time being. Um, now, Steve Jones, um, professor of genetics in London, has another favorite theory, which is about the age of marriage and so forth, which is another quite technical theory, actually, on, on his genetics, which he, he, he believes actually is a counter-argument as well to the idea there will be further speciation in humans. So, so I think most biologists just don't think that there's going to be more significant human evolution, actually. I think you get it in the press and the media. You don't, I don't find it in the biological community myself, that kind of idea. It just doesn't some, seem very likely. So we are stopping our own evolution. Okay, now the other thing, of course, one should mention here is genetic engineering. If we start meddling around, if, you, if we start meddling around with our own genomes, then that could be something different. Okay, so um, if we ever got to the point of doing that, and having the technical ability to do that, which we don't at the moment. But, um, of course, there would always be a possibility of generating people who would be genetically so different they would be unable to breed with other people, which is the biological definition of a species. So that is some, again, science fiction type of thing, but it's something that is talked about sometimes. So. Well, adaptation is a core idea within the evolutionary theory. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not that they're... One is part of the other, if you like. Evolution is the overall theory of the whole. I, really, evolution is two mechanisms stuck together. I mean, it's really A, generation of variant genomes, B, natural selection. So natural selection is really part two. And of course, Darwin didn't know about A, really. I mean, he because he didn't know about genes, he didn't know about Mendel's work and all that sort of thing. So, so really the neo-Darwinian synthesis has stuck part A onto Darwin's bit, which is really part B, and, and made them, that, that is the neo-Darwinian synthesis. So adaptation is a key part in that natural selection narrative of um, yeah, how things adapt to the environment and therefore become reproductively successful. So the key phrase we were thinking about this last night as well is not really survival of the fittest, it's actually reproductive success. That is the key criterion for, uh, for the evolutionary process. The passing of those sets of genetic variants to succeeding generations um, in, in the larger number, you know, the largest number possible, if you like. That's what it's about. So. Now, the w one thing I think where I, I, I certainly agree with Gould, I, my critic of Gould tonight is certainly not applicable to a lot of, you know, I mean, he's a great evolutionary biologist. I loved his writings. I loved his writings on natural history. But, of course, he was very critical, actually, of adaptationist stories that um, he called them rather rudely sort of just so stories, you know, that people make up as if adaptation would explain everything, and it clearly doesn't. There's a temptation sometimes in generating evolution histories to kind of make up a story which is plausible, but we just don't know that that particular organ or whatever it was was really adaptive for that particular environment. So, um, so there's a kind of discussion within the you know, evolutionary field about you have strong adaptationists, you have weak adaptationists, and that kind of discussion goes on. Argument, or is it kind of helpful? You sort of say, well, it's not in the 
provable phenomenon, just your action that fact can, can also not be disproven, or is that simply dodging the issue? I think there's a slight problem here. I mean, the la- there's a problem here in, in different forms of scientific discourse. So biologists don't use the word proof very much, actually. I mean, you know, we leave that to, I don't know, mathematical physicists and people who prove things. You know, math people prove things. Biologists never prove things. Um, so because we, we deal with all this massive data, and so we make up coherent stories. We hope they're coherent and, you know, that make sense of all that data and put it together. But the language of proof, I, d- I never encountered it within biology. We just don't use it. So when people start talking about proving or disproving, it's simply so alien to the way that biologists think. It's, it's difficult to engage with that. So, but clearly, any kind of data can come along and, and knock something down in biology. I mean, you can never be totally sure. You know? It's the old you know, proper thing with the white geese and all those sort of things. You know, if you count billions of white geese and you make up your law, they're only white geese lo and behold you go to Australia and find this wretched black geese you know one and it destroys your complete theory so I mean bi- biologists very much sort of think in those terms I think you know that so evolutionary theory can clearly be refuted I mean in principle it can be refuted and I, I think we need to emphasize that you know it's not some there's all kinds of things that would easily refute evolutionary theory especially if they were cumulative things that you know just gathered but they haven't come along yet you know so it seems to me that actually the way that we look at trying to make coherent story in, in science, and I'm thinking of the biological sciences here, is very similar to the way that theologians think, at least I think, you know, that the, there you have a lot of data, different kinds of data, and you're trying to make a coherent story about the universe and about stuff within the universe and so on, trying to make a story of that, you know, what, what is the most coherent story that makes sense of that discourse? I mean, as a Christian theist, I believe that the idea of a personal God who is a creator makes best sense of the universe in which we live. You know, it just is consistent with, you know, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. So, but I would never want to use the word proof. It just simply is not part of my vocabulary. I mean, it, it seems to me unnecessary as a word <laughs> that we can have a very strong conviction about that, but we'd always have to be open. There might be data that would come along and counteract that. I don't see how we could avoid that. You know, it's always revisable. It can never be a, a kind of absolute certainty, I know don't think we can have, I don't think humans can be in a position of absolute certainty, and if they claim that I would worry, (laughs) actually (laughs) so well well, that's also true, yes yeah. but you see, faith in the Christian sense I think is not that dissimilar I mean, there are dissimilarities but there are also some similarities between the way that you have commitment to a scientific theory, so I'm, I'm committed to evolutionary theory, why am I committed? Well, I, can't, I have to write grants. Well, I used to. I'm telling my previous thing now. But, you know, you have to write grants. You have to run a lab. You have to give projects to people. So you're committed. You're a committed person. That's faith, in a sense. You're committed to a whole framework of understanding. If you're wrong, your life is wasted. Your biological you know, your life in the lab is really wasted. You know. So you have to commit yourself to a whole framework in order to actually do anything useful in science. Uh, and I guess that's true of many theories in science as well. So it seems to me that's not that dissimilar to commitment, let's say in Christian faith, where faith is, um, you have to just sort of build on other things that people have given to you, other data, you you have to receive it and take it on board before you can get anywhere in a sort of pilgrimage of faith. So I think there's some interesting, uh, clearly there's some dissimilarities as well, but there's some interesting similarities there actually. There are at least two different ways to come at a, uh, a respect for the life around us. Um, in many forms of religious life out of, out of India, there was a great respect for all many forms of life, animal life, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the form nowadays where, where people are trying to sort out um, whether one should have any reason to believe that human life is more valuable than a, a worm, a dog, a, another animal. Does mm-hmm. all this your biological reflection give any light on how one should engage those particular kinds of questions or those quite separate questions? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I mean, it's interesting actually to listen to different biologists within the biological research field and they take, you know, you get the emphasis which would be the sort of Dawkins quote, you know, that basically we are, you know, we're just like the worms in, in one sense, you know, that, and, you know, obviously worms and bacteria are much more successful than we are, you know, in terms of reproduction. They've done better than we have, you know, we're not doing very well. So by certain strict biological criteria, obviously we don't come out very well, if you like, you know. Um, but on the other hand, but then you've got other biologists who actually underline 
the very distinctiveness of humankind that we are actually biologically we are very different you know from our, our nearest cousins that are alive today um, so in terms of language and culture and the way we do things and so forth so you get both amongst biologists and I don't think necessarily that I mean that discussion is interesting but I don't, I'm not so I don't think it actually really helps us ultimately to come up with, with the right kind of answers. It seems to me that ultimately what we believe about humankind is very much rooted in our metaphysics. You know? And so in other words, it seems to me difficult to sustain um, a strong view of the value of distinctive, human, uh, distinctive value of humankind if at the end of the day we just think humankind is another biological species. I mean, if, if that... If we think that's the case, it seems to me very hard, you know, to, to undergird the value of the human individual. And I suppose what I, I would see in, in, uh, in Christian theism is a very strong undergirding of the value of humankind as people made in the image of God and therefore has having a distinct value. Not that they're separate from nature, not at all. You know, as we were saying, they're integrally part of, but still have a particular purpose, a particular value in God's sight. So it seems to me that gives a much uh, more solid basis, um, you know, for undergirding human value. And it's interesting, you know, in Hitler's table talk, which I think I might have quoted last night, um, he had this, this, this phrase... You know that Christianity was like um, a rebellion against uh, a, a, that. Uh, sorry, that. Let's try and get the quote right. That Christianity was a rebellion against nature. I think that's how we put it. You know that that it's a that actually, if you simply take nature and it's uh, red in tooth and claw, you know, then actually, ultimately, human life doesn't. If you want to, you know, have a holocaust, you have a holocaust. I mean, what is going to restrain somebody at the end of the day? If they have no sense of judgment, they have no sense that ultimately they have to give some account of what they do. It actually undermines a lot of the power you know, of human value, the, the, the undergirding of human value. So I think you know that's obviously a big discussion, but to me you can't really extract ultimate human value out of biology, but you can at least point out that humans are very different you know, from the other species. And they have obvious, obvious abilities, you know, to, to be responsible for their own actions in a way that animals are not, and so forth and so on. So that that that's interesting, but it doesn't really get to the heart of the problem. I don't think heart of the question. I, I don't know if that makes sense. So this will be our last question. Today we hear a lot about being under the threat of like global crisis, like greenhouse gases wondering from your point of view how quickly in the evolutionary process in your our biological makeup and ability to adapt can we make a right turn in a very quick way in terms of global warming specifically well, is that in particular that, that's an example no I, I don't think I mean what do we do now you know, the, the earth will still get warmer. Right? That, that's what all the evidence suggests. So, that, so we definitely need to take urgent action, I think. But, um, but it's still, there's going to be a huge lag phase. You know, the, the earth will, whatever we do now in the next 5, 10 years, 15 years, it's going to take a very long time before that will impact on the slowing down of global warming. But that's definitely not an argument against action. That's an argument for action. But obviously very difficult for governments in an economic downturn for investing, you know, in, in human life sort of 40, 50 years, a century from now. That's not the sort of thing that governments usually do. So that, that's the really tough challenge, I think. Um, so, yeah, well, I think the urgent action is really essential. I think that it's not a question that we will adapt. It will be a question that the poor of the world will suffer, the people living in Bangladesh in, in very low-lying areas who will suffer from flooding, and uh, you know, when you look at the parts of the world that will suffer most from uh, from global warming, it is mostly the poorer parts of the world, and uh, it is the poor that will suffer. And I think the the richer parts of the world will move house; they'll go to higher ground; they'll you know cope in some way, uh, and so forth. But uh, that'll be very hard, I think, for for the poor, and uh, it will lead, I think, to mass migration of peoples, they will have to move from areas, they have to move from low-lying areas as the sea level rises, uh, and so forth. So, so there's, there's serious things, you know, that I think will happen, which should make our actions more urgent. And I think those who, who have religious commitments 
you know, should see that as, as a very uh, serious commitment for their own religious communities to get them involved. And the wonderful thing about religious communities is they're so integrated into the life of people around the world. So whether it's churches or mosques and temples and so forth, if you can get an environmental message out clearly through religious communities, they are grassroots. You know, they can actually change things very locally in a sustainable kind of way that governments actually can't do. So I think it, there has to be government action, but I think there also has to be this local level action, which is going on, but could be much more. You know, so, so you thank don't you. see biological change I don't think so because I think we, we are so coming back to adaptation we are so adaptable I mean we all let already can cope you know with huge variations especially in Canada you know being very hot and very cold I mean you know, people survive here look at all these people you know still here so you know I mean it's um, it, it does show doesn't it how adaptable people are to different climates and how they can go and live at the North Pole the South Pole and you know all that kind of thing so so the actual adaptation I think won't be that striking biologically I mean there will be some adapt adaptations no doubt but I'm not sure I don't think that's it's not going to change the genomes that much I don't think actually the diet will change a bit and perhaps we'll get a few palm trees you know in Cambridge that'll be nice yeah. Cambridge <laughs> Cambridge will be underwater, I think, apparently, so we'll all move to Oxford and, uh, you know, when the sea level, ri sea level rises. Um, but, yeah, I, I think people will move and adapt in that way. So. Well, and that brings our um, lectures for this year to an end. And, Dr. Alexander, we'd like to thank you for coming all the way from the UK to winter, wintry Canada. Uh, to deliver these lectures, and you certainly join a very esteemed group of people who have <coughs> delivered these lectures before you, and we thank you for your contribution to the ongoing discussion about the relationship between Christianity and the university. So we also wish you a very safe trip back home. Thank you very much. Thank you.